There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a discussion with two brilliant people about this novel in translation from Greek. It's called Three Summers by Margarita Liberaki, translated from the Greek by Karen Van Dyck. And I am here with two special guests, both of whom you have seen on my channel before. First we have Cecilia from Singapore. Welcome back, Cecilia. Hello. <laughs> she's a, a friend of a bookish friend of mine that I originally met on Litzy, and she's been a guest on my channel a time or two. And uh, also no stranger to Sean the Book Maniac is Electra, who is Greek and currently lives in Istanbul. Welcome back. Hello, Electra. hello. Hello, hello. So we've all read the book. Cecilia read it last month. And uh, I think yep. Electra and I both finished it last night. Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's a little fresh for us. I'd like to get us started by just going around and getting kind of a brief three, three minute or so, two, one or two, three minute take on what did you like it? What, why, why or why not? Hey, this is Editing Sean. I realized that I didn't really give any kind of an introduction to the novel. I've told you the title, the author, the translator, but I didn't really give you kind of an introduction. So in a sentence or two, it is set in 1945, as Electra will clarify later in this video. In, set in the suburbs of Athens with a fairly well-to-do family and all of their neighbors and the family consists of a grandfather, his two daughters, one of whom is, has never married and the other who is married and divorced with three children who are from uh, mid-adolescence into age 20 at the opening of the story. The oldest sister is Maria, the middle sister is Infanta, and the youngest sister, who I think is about 14, and her name is Katerina. So, should have said that at the outset, and now I have. Okay. Let's start. Cecilia. Well, I read this book for the NYRB Classics Reading Society, which is my in-real-life book club in Singapore. This is our July pick. And we had a discussion at the end of July. The average was 2.6 stars. Okay. <laughs> I gave, yeah, <laughs> I gave it four stars. I so I gave the highest rating. Why did you give it four stars? Um, thanks to COVID, I've been a mood reader, right? Um, these past few months. To me, this is just a very enchanting, very, you know, it has a very summery feeling. I truly enjoyed the book. It feels like just walking down the village, like Katerina walking down the village and saying hello to the neighbors. You know, that's, that's how I felt about it. So I quite enjoyed it. I didn't find the change of point of views distracting, but that was actually what one of my book club buddies found very disturbing. Sean, you remember like uh, uh, I mentioned to you that I didn't enjoy a few of the harbor by Elizabeth uh, Taylor. I do remember that. Yeah, that was uh, quite surprising because I love Elizabeth Taylor, mm -hmm. and I found that a few of the harbor is quite similar to these three summers, in a way that both authors is actually just dissecting the people in the village. Mm -hmm. Uh, telling the inner voices of this, uh, the people in the village. But somehow, I didn't enjoy a view of the harbor, maybe because of, you know, the affair, the love affair in the book. Mm -hmm. But in terms of describing uh, inner voices, I found that Elizabeth Taylor's technique was much better than Margarita Liberaki. Mm, great. How about Electra? Very mixed feelings. So there were some things that I really enjoyed in the book and some things that caught me by surprise, knowing, kind of like being aware of the social norms of the time and having read other books written in that same period. There were some things that were definitely pleasantly surprising. But at the same time, I just couldn't... Initially, I started reading it. The date isn't stated right away. They don't start with saying, like, this is the year 1945. So I was like, okay, it was published in 46, mm -hmm. but maybe it was written before the war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm trying to read it in, with that in mind, but then, you know, it's very clearly stated that this is 1945. Yeah. And then it, that's where it, like the, in the back of my head, I'm, 
I start to shout and I'm like, this is very detached from the Greek reality of the time. Like this is not 1945 Athens for the vast majority of Greek people. It just doesn't make sense. As rich as you might be and as far away as you might be in your like green suburbs, it's just, I just couldn't get that out of my head. So I read a big chunk of the book with that in mind. And it was like this scream in the back of my head, like, no, like, how can you be so detached from reality? Because, so Greece was devastated by World War II. And right after World War II, it was plunged into a civil war. So, and Athens was like at the center of everything. So it just, it was like, it was a big no for me in that sense. But if I were to take the dates and the historical context aside, there were some things that I really enjoyed. The relationship with nature, it felt like a Greek summer to me. Even like as someone who was born in the 80s and didn't live through that time period and those customs, still it felt like a Greek summer to me. Mm. Having said all of that, the only character that I could not relate to, but that came across as like, real to me was Maria. Everyone else just felt really, really, really made up. Mm. Okay. So yeah, I had a really hard time putting everything together and like making sense of the story. A lot of the feelings, uh, some of the scenes were really intense and I really enjoyed them, but there were a lot of just, well, no, I I don't want to say unrealistic, but a lot of points where I was like, well, you are clearly a character in a novel and not a real person. Like, you don't make sense as a real person in the world kind of thing, especially Katrina. Huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about you, Sean? Uh, hey, well, boy, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a great, <laughs> great discussion. I really liked it, in, probably in a four-star way. I was hoping that maybe you people might convince, bring me up to five stars by helping me out with the ending because I had trouble with the ending. For those of you who are watching, we are not going to talk about the ending now. At the end of this discussion, we will get into spoilery content about the ending and I will give you lots of warning and you, the viewer, can decide whether or not you want to watch that. But I struggled a bit with the ending. I... I'm fascinated by everything that you two have both said. The I thought the atmosphere was incredibly rich, mm. and I felt like I was there. I felt like she didn't overdo the symbolism, but the sim- symbolism was there that each sister had their own garden, and the garden kind of spoke to mm-hmm. their character in a way. That worked for me, and I remembered it throughout as I was reading the book. I liked th- the depth at which the characters were portrayed, they didn't necessarily make sense, but I know people, I know other Greek people who don't make sense. Just a joke. I know other people. <laughs> I know lots of people who don't, who don't you make sense. About. <laughs> <laughs> I know lots of people who don't make sense. They were uh, each in their own way was a bit batshit crazy. And uh, okay. I enjoyed that. I like novels that are loose, baggy monsters. I forget who I'm quoting. Somebody said, you know, the, the, the English novel is a loose baggy monster. And I, I like that. And this was really loose and really baggy. Yeah. It really carried a lot of stuff in it. And I'm not sure everything all fit together. And for the most part, I didn't care because I enjoyed reading each part of it, even if I was kind of shaking my head. What does this have to do with anything? Yeah. So I want to get into the ending in a bit, but I'd like to now use what you people have mentioned. So let's get into the atmosphere, which is what, Cecilia, you said you liked the most. And in fact, really, you could put your two comments together that was there really an, a narrative arc so much as an extended character study? The, the people yeah. in the neighborhood, especially the three sisters, but really rich portraits of neighbors down the street. and. Yeah, we have the various characters, right? There's a quite weird, in a way. Who's that lady? David's mother? With the... Ruth? You know, yeah, with the dolls and, the, you know, a house, like, it looks like a kid's house. I think that's quite interesting. And Mrs. Parigori. What makes it interesting is Katerina's imagination, because she is an unreliable narrator. I think it's uh, in her imagination that David and Mrs. Parigori has an affair. 
and it makes it really interesting. Oh, so you didn't think that there was anything going on other than what was going on in her head? Oh. I think, I think it's just in her imagination. Mm. I keep guessing what is exactly the character is about, whether it, it is true or it's just in a categorized head. But I really enjoy, as you said, the atmosphere of the book about uh, the summer, like uh, from one summer to another. And then how this, uh, the village is actually just with the brisk of summer there with uh, Katerina walking around the village and meeting the, each individual's um, in the village itself. I think that is a very refreshing. I'm not questioning you, Electra, but I didn't remember anything in the text that specifically said 1945. What was that? I think it was about Mrs. Parigori. They're talking about her style of dress, and they say, well, uh, she dressed, it's 1945, and she dresses like it's the 30s, and in the 30s, she was dressing like it was the 1920s, or something like that. Right. Mm. I remember the passage, oh, I remember that the yeah. year was in there, yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, I can see why you would feel that way. In retrospect, does that change your feeling about anything, Cecilia? No. I feel that, to me, it really depends on my mood. I was in the right mood to read this. Mm. And, and that's why I enjoyed it. If I were more critical, I'd probably dislike this book because of the way the story was told. It's mm. a kid jumping around from... One moment is the Katharina's point of view, and then we get Mrs. Parigori's diary. You know, it's very confusing. Hmm. Well, what does it mean? You know, I, I, I was wondering, like, uh, when, when I read her diary, right, or her letter, I'm just wondering, okay, where, where is she going to lead me to, you know, after this? And then the author actually switched back to Katharina's point of view. So that is quite a dislocation there. Certainly the way that the novel is written, the way that it's narrated, Liberaki herself is inviting us to experience Katerina as an unreliable narrator. There's much is made about her rich fantasy life and her lying. Even at the very end, she says, I'm not sure everything in, that I've said in this story is actually true. I mean, so we're encouraged to, to add that yeah. layer of ambiguity to what we've read, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would like to amend my comment to say that the characters that really didn't make sense to me were like the core family. Everyone mm-hmm. else felt like, yeah, okay, I, I really enjoy reading about you, like the, the big family with the father who's like in and out of jail. Like I really enjoyed reading about like the surrounding, like the neighbors and the, like the shepherd boy and all of that. But the core family, the three sisters and the mother and yeah, possibly also the grandfather. They just didn't. Inter- very interesting. They were certainly very strange. Mm. Yeah. I thought maybe yeah. the grandfather could have been a little bit more fully drawn, but he was just kind of disappearing into old age, I guess. Mm. Uh, a central family secret that comes out in the first chapter, so this is not a spoiler, is that the grandmother, she was Polish, and she mm. ran away with a musician uh, very early in their marriage. There's things about that that come out at the end. And the three sisters' parents have divorced. We don't meet the father often, but I thought he was quite a colorful character. One of my favorite scenes was with him and the uncle when their car breaks down and they're barbecuing, they're fishing and barbecuing at the beach and the mother comes, she doesn't know where the kids are. Or did they have a car accident? Was it a car accident? Yes. Car broke down, ran out of gas. They ran out of gas, that's right. And, but the mother's worried that there was a car accident. I think that's what I'm remembering. Yeah. And she finally yeah. finds him and she's really upset and takes the children away. Yeah. But yeah. One of my favorite passages was, do you remember the passage about the father and the daughters when they would go to visit and he would read to them? Yes. yes. That's yeah. one of my favorite. If, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read that. Yeah, they, the children were very young when the parents split up and he would get them maybe on the weekends or fairly regularly. This is from page 37. Once a week when we would come in from the country for a visit, he would read them to us, and she's referring to Robinson Crusoe in the Jungle Book. He would read them to us from beginning to end. All three of us would lie on his big bed with half-closed eyes, listening. Now we are older and embarrassed to ask him, and he is embarrassed to suggest it. So there are huge silences full of Robinson Crusoe and the Jungle Book, as if he were still reading and we were still listening. Those silences make us all very sad. As a reader, I really 
thought that was a beautiful passage. And now, I, reflecting on it, having finished the book, there is something in there as well about the storytelling, uh, the suspicious storytelling at the heart of the story, the naivete of the central narrator, and mm -hmm. the theme of becoming an adult, which is yeah. something their father never quite finished. He never quite grew up. So that passage is going to stay with me. Can I talk about the things that I found a bit refreshing for a book written mm. at that time in Greece? Yes, please. Greece is a fairly, still is like a fairly conservative country, a lot of hang-ups in terms of like race, inter interracial marriage, even like interreligious marriage. So reading about a family where the mother is Jewish and the father is Greek Orthodox and they still end up getting married. And David is indeed Jewish, but he, like, by faith, he's Greek Orthodox. So that yeah. makes him kind of acceptable. But at the same time, there are those hints about anti-Semitic, like, tropes. Like, oh, he has, like, devilish eyes or whatever. The anti-Semitism was there, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. That was surprising to me. The Polish grandmother being like this, you know, non-presence, but like this shadow over the, the entire story was also quite different. The divorce was not something that was happening very much in Greece, uh, let alone like at the initiation of the, the wife mm -hmm. and because of infidelity. Mm -hmm. Never heard of such a thing. Like, like even like in the 50s and 60s, like never ever heard of anyone like getting divorced for that reason like especially it being the woman's decision so that was quite different I really enjoyed those things there's also a mention of the girls seeing this couple going into a maternity clinic and then coming out like a few hours later and one of the sisters saying like must have been an abortion which also wasn't something that was talked about openly at the time it was happening for sure but it was not something that 18 year olds would have necessarily known about and would have been aware enough to like realize that's what's happening here. So it was interesting in that, like, I would be curious to see how the readers of the time processed all of that, like what they made of this family that was by those standards fairly progressive. So yeah, all of those things I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. But as I said, like Athens was in ruins at the time. They lived like the, the area, the village that's uh, described in the book is basically Athens now. It's like, it's the wealthy suburbs, but it's like a train ride away from the city center. It's like 30 minutes from the city center. So it's not out there in the country or anything. The girls do visit Athens like quite often to see their dad, but there's no mention of anything happening. Like it's like the war didn't happen. There's mention of the Spanish war, but not. The Greek Civil War, World War II, the Nazi occupation of Greece. Like, there's none of that there. I get yeah. that, you know, this is a really wealthy family. And nobody seems to be working other than the dad, who is not supporting the family financially. Um, but they live this enchanted life out in the country with, like, their animals and their trees and their flowers and all of that. And, you know, wealthy people, of course, had a much better deal during the war, but... I don't think they were that detached from reality, basically. Mm. I'd like to spend a minute talking about the author, because I haven't read much more than the introduction by the translator, but Margarita Liberaki, this was somewhat autobiographical. Can I just add the note about the author, that uh -huh. this is a woman who graduated from law school in That's the middle right. of World War II, That's right. which is also unheard Amazing. of. So she was a very special person indeed. She did go against the grain in so many ways, so that's worth mentioning as well. And I'm kind of bouncing off what Electra just said. She was a product of a broken home, and then mm -hmm. she had a baby uh, when she was writing this, or just after, just before she wrote this, and then she left her husband within months of this publication, moved to Paris. So her mm -hmm. daughter came from a broken home, and her mm -hmm. daughter she became a famous yeah. Greek novelist. Mm -hmm. And the translator, Karen Van Dyck, worked on this translation, staying, living for, I don't know, a summer or something with Margarita Liberaki and her daughter, whose name I don't have on my, my tip of my tongue, and they helped her with the translation. So there's a whole bunch of stuff about translation and about feminism and about uh, like divorce and social mores in all that. 
So how about, this is a very light hearted invitation. Nobody needs to make a commitment a year in advance, but I would be very interested in Buddy reading one of her daughter's novels with you two next year for Women in Translation Month. Yeah. They have Has she been translated? Her most well-known ones have. Sure. How okay. easy they are to get, I don't know. But I better get her name into this video, so. Cool. Electra, help me with the translation. Margarita Karen Pano. Carapano. Carapano. Margarita Cara Carapano is the daughter. So we're going to get into spoiler territory here, people. If you, we're going to talk about the ending. If you don't want to hear about the ending in a spoilery way, stop watching now. What did you guys make of the ending? I was quite surprised. Katharina found out that the mother had been corresponding with the Polish grandmother. Yes. What I found weird is that the Polish grandmother kept got, getting information about the family, but no one in the family actually knew about it. The mother never told the other members of the family about this, uh, the correspondence, and that the grandmother didn't tell the mother about her own lives after she ran away with the musician, what, what happened after that. We knew nothing about it. It didn't make sense to me given the contempt she expresses early on in the story towards the Polish grandmother and how she tries to banish her from everyone's memory. So when Katerina says, you know, uh, I love her, I like her, mm. she's like, no, she, uh, she was selfish, she didn't care about us, she didn't love us, you know, all of that, she just hates her. Oh, that's what she expresses in that scene. So to find out that all these years she has been talking to her and like giving her updates and sending her photos, it's just... And very affectionate letters, we presume. Yes, indeed. I mean, she sends her photos of the baby, so it, this is not a woman who like absolutely loathes her and has no space for forgiveness. Yeah, I didn't think of that. That's a brilliant point. I never put that together, that she, her stance about the grandmother to her children was very hostile or negative. The thing that bothered me the most about the ending was about this old cousin that she goes to pick up the letters that is writing a novel based on his son's travels around the world. Like when that came into the story at the very end, I was going, what the hell is this? Why, why is he in here? And then, and then the way it comes right in at yeah. the end. And then it's like Dallas from the 1980s. It was just a dream. Yeah. Yeah. But yet the son had come home, but it was just a dream that He'd gone off to the beach with Infanta. That, yeah. that kind of sickened me. Yeah. I don't think it was necessary. That was overkill, and that was the author's imagination kind of getting away with it. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, it would have been one thing to just have the old man in the background, and like he just he delivers the letters and that's it. But I was like, why am I reading about this person and his son who's like <laughs> off, like fighting other people's wars or whatever. Like, I don't care. Like, who are you? Yeah. Dropping you know? off love letters from an airplane. And then that woman yeah. steals in fantasy. Right? Like, uh, yeah, that, that was just one level too far. So that's why, and I'm hmm. going to end with this in terms of you have not budged me off. This was a four-star read because I thought there was just a lot of weird stuff at the end that was completely unnecessary to the story that she was telling. Yeah. <sighs> but I enjoyed reading it very much. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Electra. And thanks, everybody out there. Thank you for watching.